Thank you. Oh, I need a remote. You need a remote? Yeah. So, uh, here we are. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for being here. I know it was a hard day last night. So, so yeah, thank you for, for making it. And thanks to the organizers for creating such a cool event. We are very excited to be here. Also a little nervous, but I hope that's okay. Um, so my name is Fran. I'm Diego. And uh, well, we've been uh, building mobile uh, products for a while, but what's cool about us is that we've been doing it together for a few years now. So I think that we've learned uh, a, few, a few lessons that we'd like to share uh, with, you, with you today. We work for this company uh, called Lonely Planet that maybe some of you have heard uh, of. It's a, it's a travel company. It, when it was founded by these two guys that so you can see on the first photo, it's uh, Tony and Maureen Wheeler, which in 1973, after their first, uh, well, that's their, after their uh, wedding, they went on a honeymoon like people do, and they went from London to Australia, and, you know, they backpacked all the way there. So, uh, you know, they, they, when they got to to Australia, they, they wanted to, you know, they were so amazed by the trip that they wanted to write a book about it, and they called it Asia on the Chip, and, you know, it became a success, and so they started a business uh, with it. Uh, so this is Tony, uh, this must be somewhere in the 80s with his first computer that he used to, to, uh, to write some, uh, some, some of those guidebooks, so yeah, a little bit of history there. Yeah, so back in 2009, uh, I started this company called uh, Tristai, uh, where Fran then joined uh, to, be, to work on the, on the mobile apps. And with Tristai, we're trying to, to apply modern solutions to, to travel. You know, uh, we, we're, we thought that there was a better way uh, to do travel, to help the travelers with technology, with webs or with apps. And we started a company out of that. Um, yeah, so long story short, uh, we pivoted a couple of times. We went all the, pro all the, the whole process from an MVP to uh, investment rounds uh, to, uh, you know, um, all the different stages that a useless startup goes. And we end up selling the company to, to Lonely Planet in 2013. And that's how we got to start to, to work for, for Lonely Planet. Um, yeah, so after a while working on, on different projects and mostly on, on Tourist Eye and on Aaron Eye and the uh, projects, we got assigned the task to, to build up a new flagship app, a new product that uh, should uh, represent the, the, what Lonely Planet is on, on mobile devices. And uh, we had a pretty uh, limited uh, deadline. And, but we wanted to, that app to feel like Lonely Planet. We wanted to not only put all the content from the books in the, in the app, but to do something, something really, really uh, meaningful and useful for the users when they're traveling. So in order to do that, we had to reduce the scope a lot. We had to cut out a lot of features. And instead of going uh, with social and have like a super complex trip planner, stuff like that, as everybody else was, was doing back in the time, we decided to go to the other way and do the opposite and do something super simple uh, that only does one thing and does it uh, right. And to do that, we followed uh, these, these, these principles, these points. We, um, we focused on the underground experience. As you guys know, uh, during the, tra the trip journey, there are uh, five stages. There's the uh, pre-planning, then the booking, then you go to the destination, well, first is the inspiration, and then you share what you, what you have seen, what you have experienced. And we, we didn't want to attack all those different stages. We wanted to focus only on the underground experience, what you, uh, the experience of you being in the city and using the app there. We wanted only to have uh, created content because that's what actually makes Lonely Planet different. We didn't want to offer you all the uh, POIs, all the, all the content for a city, all the restaurants, all the, all the hotels, because that that's not how you uh, plan a trip. You don't want to have all, all, those, uh, all those sources of information. You want to know what's the best, what is the off the beaten path uh, things to do, and stuff like that. We wanted to focus on, on the experience and, and make a pretty honest uh, product. We didn't want it to feel like there has some, 
it's got some, some tricky uh, growth uh, features, stuff like that. We wanted to deliver what the app actually promised, do something really simple and, and, and really make that experience the selling point for a product. And yeah, we wanted to do one thing and do it and do it right. So to do this, we had a pretty limited team, a fairly small team. We had two iOS developers, we had two Android developers, and we had one product designer, which was Diego here. And uh, you know, also what's unique about our team is that we were all distributed, um, you know, from different parts of, of the world. So that that you know that was a, a pretty big constraint. So the app that we built, we ended up calling it Guides, and it's a you know the first version of a much bigger app that we want to end up building. It was you know like Diego said, it was focused on the ground. It was you know very very limited, but in the future, it will grow to to many more things, and we're already working on those on those things. Um, um, yeah, so yeah, that was guides. And uh, we we're you know, pretty happy, even though it was limited, we were ha pretty happy with the results. We got a lot of downloads in the app, in the, from both app stores. I think we are up to like 1.5 million. And what we're happy the most is that we, we got a pretty good average rating on the both app stores, like 4.5 and 4.9 on, on both app stores. So we are, pr we are pretty happy about that too. And you know, to build this app, we follow a pretty standard procedure that probably like many of you follow uh, this process of like framing the problem, then validating that you're you have, uh, yeah the, that's the problem you want to solve, and executing a solution, um, building uh, you know uh, a solution for that problem, and then measuring, and then iterating, and then you keep you keep doing this this uh, this cycle. Um, so so yeah, I'm gonna leave it up to Diego to to talk about frame. Yeah. So based on all, all that process, which is probably pretty similar to what you, the way you guys build, build products, you, you have an idea, you validate it, and so on, we wanted to pick only the parts of that process that we thought it would have been uh, really useful for us and that had helped us a lot during this, this product. Um, some of them are only for us because we are remote. Everyone is remote in the team, and we, we are distributed. But maybe you can take some, some takeaways out of that. So the first stage is, is framing. It's framing the, the, um, the, um, the product. And the first step for that is, is understanding the, the problem that you're trying to solve. I feel like this is something that we tend to forget or we tend to just keep. And uh, great, like great products solve real problems. And having the, spending the time on defining what is the, exactly the problem that you're trying to solve is absolutely worth it. Worth it. Um, um, yeah, to do this, we did a lot of research, as, as you probably guys did too. Uh, we did surveys, we, did, uh, we analyzed all the data that we had on tourist eye, we did uh, interviews, we even got to go to airports and interview people who were about to travel because that's the perfect moment where you can ask someone how they go there, what, what tools have they used, what do they like or not. And, and in that process, we also made the developers of the team part of, part of it because we felt like, uh, because we are such a small team, everybody needs to be super aligned or what, what we were trying to build and getting to understand the problem that we were trying to solve was pretty important. So we tried that everyone in the team was, was part of that. Um, yeah, this one is tricky. Uh, most of the times we tend to think that the goal of the company is, is, the, is its business and sometimes it's not. And uh, we tend to develop solutions that also just add value to the business, but not to the company itself. It's not the same mission uh, that, that the business. And, and a pretty simple example I use, this happens in, in many companies, in many departments every day, but I try to use an, uh, one of our mistakes. This is the Lonely Planet website back in, in 90, 97, I think. And when the, it was one of the first um, websites to come up, and when the whole internet exploded, uh, Lonely Planet tried to, well, they wanted to be there. And instead of using the internet as a channel to create more product, like products that actually add value to the users, they tried to sell more books because they thought that the mission of the company was to sell books. But the mission of the company is not to sell books. It's actually to inspire people to travel and to help them to get to the heart of the destination. So sometimes it's super easy to think that the business is actually the mission of the company. And, so, and because of that, you end up building products to, that just for the business and not for the, 
for the company mission. So, and with, with guides, we tried to, to avoid that and actually build something that was meaningful for, for the, the company and not only for the business. So now you understand the problem that you have, so it's time to execute and really build a solution for, for this problem. And we had a couple of constraints, uh, pretty big ones for our team. Like we had a, a pretty tight deadline that we wanted to hit, and well, probably a lot of you do too. But uh, we also uh, are a, re a remote te team, like I said, and we, you know, we work across like very distant time zones. Like sometimes we're, you know, uh, even like nine hours apart. Like from some people, if you're in London, if you're in Madrid, and then someone else is in San Francisco, like we're very far apart. So we wanted to really. Uh, you know, build processes that will help us uh, build this app efficiently. And to do that, we need to do two things. We need to maximize feedback and minimize in, uh, yeah, interruptions. Because when you, uh, when you, um, yeah, so when you, uh, you know, like in order to, to create a good product, you need, you need a, lot of, a lot of feedback because when you put something out there and some, somebody else gives you feedback, you improve your previous solution and make it better. And also, since we were a remote team, we wanted to uh, minimize interruptions and minimize blockers so that we would never like, be blocking each other. Like if I got started working in the morning and somebody else was sleeping in, in the States, uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't block me and I could uh, continue, continue working. So the first thing that we did in order to, to uh, avoid blocking each other was um, a, simple, a simple thing that didn't t take that long, but I think was very effective. If, and that was you know, making sure that everybody in the team is able to run the code. Because when you are able to run the code, you don't need, for some, you don't need to wait for somebody else to give you, you know, whatever you need. Like if, he, if Diego wants to see what a, what a feature looks like, he doesn't need to wait for me to hand them a build or a, a screenshot or a vi video or whatever, you know? Like he, he can just do it himself, right? If I'm an iOS developer and someone like my Android teammates want me to test some, you know, some of the builds, I can just do it myself. So like we all are able to, to run the code and that makes for, uh, you know, for, for much uh, tighter loops. The second thing that we did that I think was pretty useful is like using specs. Not only, I'm not talking only about like, uh, you know, specs in, in a design document like Sketch or Photoshop or whatever. I'm talking about really uh, written down specs that you have. Uh, we, we do it on GitHub, but, uh, but yeah, you can, you can do it whatever. What we like about uh, GitHub is that uh, you know, it provides us a place, a tool that we already use for development uh, to, have, to have it written there. So, um, you know, we have really long uh, detailed specs that we can iterate on and we can work on. And, and for example, if I need to get start working, no one else is working, I can just, uh, yeah, just get started, get all the details and, and move on. So it's really useful for that. Um, you know, one other thing that we do to provide uh, feedback to each other is like we release uh, pretty frequent uh, betas. Like usually, like every day, we release a, a beta at least with the last features that we merged, like bug fixes. So, if I know that I fixed a bug yesterday and I'm on the bus going to work or like I'm having a coffee break or whatever, I can just download the latest latest uh, app, the latest version of the app, and just make sure that everything is okay. Same thing for my for my you know for my Android uh, colleagues or you know Diego can do it. Anyone can do it. Can pull the just the latest version of the app and just make sure that everything is okay, that everything is looking good, and get feedback. And that also you know like that makes it uh, that makes it better. And we use Hockey App well, just because we, we really like it. It, was, it provided um, you know, a support for Android and iOS, and you know, it, was, it was the best tool that, that we could find. There, was, there were other ones, but they were harder to use, so, so we went with, with Hockey App. And one of the things that happened when you have uh, you know, betas and people that want to test the betas is like, you know, like everybody gets excited about wanting to test the beta, but the problem is that if you, you know, if you just send them too many betas, even if it's within the company, they're gonna quickly get tired and not, not test it. So we're more careful about public betas than we are with daily ones. So we only like put out a public beta or, you know, external beta once we wanna test like a big feature or like, you know, a, like a, a big version of the app. So uh, yeah, that, you know, that, that's really, it's pretty useful. Uh, we, we release, you know, if we want to release a new feature, we put out a public beta, 
and we found that only about like 10% of the people that you know sign up for a beta actually end up testing it, and of those, like maybe only a handful of people end us end up uh, giving us feedback about it. So, so, so yeah, we you know uh, we yeah we use public betas, so. and uh, yeah, so yeah, we we. Uh, some of you guys have talked about prototypes in other, in other talks. Uh, we use, of course, Prototype in 2. Uh, it's a great way to communicate uh, with your developer, with your designer, and when you have an idea, to, to give it uh, to them or to show it to them as, as much, uh, as closer to reality as possible. Um, so um, we use different tools for this. We use, uh, depending on the stage of the process, we tend to use Flinto or Marvel or any of those simple uh, animation tools, um, programming tools uh, for the navigation stuff. So if I want to share with someone how the navigation of a feature, of a, even like bigger products uh, is going to be, I will use uh, Flinto, which is super fast and super simple. It allows me to build a bunch of prototypes in the morning and, and based on that get a lot of feedback and the same day uh, take a decision of either if I should go in a direction or another. And then we use uh, Framer for more complex interactions and, and animations. Uh, Framer, uh, you, in Framer you can use logics, you can use a lot of, well, I don't know if you guys have used it, but it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, you can do a lot of stuff, and, and we use it to, uh, to validate a lot of like super complex uh, animations or uh, some complex interactions that are harder to do with, with other software. And uh, something else that we do on the prototyping side, or that have been pretty useful for us in the past with this app, has been uh, side projects. Uh, like three years ago, Fran and I built this, this little app called Instagram, which was a simple way to, to display Instagram pictures in a map. So you will be able to see pictures around you. You will be able to see pictures based on a location. It was pretty cool because we're, when you were about to travel somewhere, you could just search for the destination, see what was going on there. and, and and uh, you know, that, that will give you information. And uh, as you can see, the layout is pretty similar. It's based on a split view of a map and a list. And you know, what you see on the map is actually what is being represented in the list. And back in the time, we thought about it. But then when we started working on guides, it was pretty useful. And, and we ended up using the same kind of layout. And the whole app is based on, on that layout. So if we hadn't spent the time to work on, um, on Instagram, we probably have have ended up doing something different on, on guides. Then we have the style guide. And the style guide is not the same of a, you probably know, but it's not the same as, as a UI kit. We the spent, the style guide has been super useful for us in order to set a set of constraints for, that both designers and developers have to follow. And that has saved us a lot of time uh, with this back and forth. And developers can just reuse a lot of code and based out of, of, the, of the style guide, which is basically uh, fonts, colors, sizes, buttons, we were able to build a UI kit. And the UI kit was, uh, well, um, based on atomic, the, uh, this atomic design approach, where you have like atoms and different, different parts of the app. And because of that, then it was super easy for developers to create new screens, because everything was based on, on, on the same kind of elements. And for me, it's also super useful when I need to create a new screen, because I can just like literally drag and drop elements and put together a screen in, in, in minutes, because most of the things in the app uh, uh, follow the same patterns, the same style guide, the same, the same uh, structure. Uh, so yeah, you can, in a schedule, you can create symbols, nested symbols, and it's just a matter of minutes to put a screen together just by dragging and drop uh, stuff. We also use a library called Twix, made by Facebook. So ideally, your designer should, have a, should know a little bit of Xcode or, or Android or whatever the tool the developers are using. So he or she can dig into the code or at least open it up and, and make some tweaks. Uh, I don't know if you guys, but like we, we in the past, we spent a lot of time uh, trying to validate some things, uh, especially like little changes. What I wanted to like change a color, or to change the size of something, uh, to change a font, 
I will need to ping Fran and be constantly uh, making changes. And the other way around, when he made, uh, if he's working on, a, on, a, on an issue and he needs to show me something so I can say, hey, well, that's looking good, uh, we will spend a lot of time there. So by using tweaks, you can just add a string uh, in the code uh, uh, for the parameters that you want to allow anyone to tweak. And because it runs at runtime, you can actually use the app. And in the app, we have this uh, little section where you can open it up and pretty much tweak every single value where we have it done in, in the code. So in this example, I'm changing right from the app the size of the icon without opening Xcode or without opening uh, your, your code editor. And that's been pretty good, because then I just need to literally sell, uh, tell Fran the actual uh, values of the code that I want to change, and he will implement it. And we don't need to like review it, and we don't need to spend time uh, reviewing that. The next step was uh, listen. Uh, it's actually measure. But we thought, like, you probably guys know all about measure. Uh, uh, analytics, uh, there's a lot of like solutions for that. So one really like is, is, is spending the right time to listen to your users. And uh, in order to do that, we spend a lot of time creating and building uh, additional communication channels for, for the app. Um, because we thought, realized that it actually, uh, it helps you look more transparent to the user. and. It, it, it facilitates the, the communication with them. Uh, in the app, there are many places where we actually uh, build ways for the users to, to uh, contact us or to report issues. Uh, actually, you can report an issue for almost every single screen in the app, which, again, has been really helpful for us. First, to increase the communication a lot. Second, to know exactly where, because I don't know if, if you talk with, if you, um, answer all the, all the support tickets, but it's a pain in the ass. And uh, if you try to like, ask the user how like, to reproduce the issue, how was the bug, and so on, uh, it's, always, it's always hard. So if we at least know where all those things were happening, and which screens or which parts in the app, that will save us a lot of time. And again, we do that. Uh, we, like, the whole team does that. Uh, we reply to all the support tickets ourselves because that helps us to stay in touch with the users, and, and that helps us uh, stay in align with, with what the users feel or what the users think about the app, what they use, what they don't use, to detect super fast uh, what is working, what is not. Uh, so we do all the, all, the, all the support as well. And again, in order to be more transparent and in order to talk more with, with the users, uh, we are constantly asking questions, and we are constantly asking for feedback. But we realized that by just placing a feedback button in the home screen, the feedback was, was pretty generic and not, not really what we wanted. So we started to ask for feedback in concrete parts of the app. So the context for that feedback that we wanted to, to get was better. It was like a more intentional approach. Uh, for instance, one of the things that we did is right when we launched the, the app, the app was, uh, only had 35 cities because we wanted to start lean and so on and we couldn't wait. Uh, so the people, uh, the users, started to say, well, there's not a lot of, a lot of uh, cities. I wanted, I wanted to have this city that I'm going to. And you know, that's one star in the App Store. And so now what we do is, when you're, looking, when, when you're searching for a city, uh, if the city that you're looking for is not in the app, we ask you and we allow you to vote for it. And it ranks into, into a database. In right into that moment, Right when we know that you want, you're asking for that city and you want to go to that city, we now present a Google form, super simple, asking why do you want to go there, and then it's, it's the perfect moment to ask and to get that information. We ask things like, uh, why are you going there? Are you a traveler? Are you a local? Are, are, you, are you going to go to that city soon? It's just uh, because you really want, like that city. And then we can first make a list of what it, what, which cities are the people looking for most that we don't have. And also, we can, we can start getting a lot of additional information. Other ways, we'll be, we'll be gone. Yep. Another, another place where we, you know, we're going to get feedback from users, well, we want to get, and we do get a lot of it, is App Store reviews. And at first, we weren't getting enough. And some of it was bad due to not having enough cities. 
So we wanted more and we wanted better. So asking, asking for feedback in the right place uh, was good. So we started asking for reviews, you know, after a, a positive, um, a sort of positive action. So if like the user did something positive or like downloaded the map or do, did something that was good for them, like that's when we asked. But we didn't want to do it in an intrusive way. We didn't want to interrupt the flow just to ask for, for you know, an app store review like many apps do. So we integrated the view into the, the flow of the app so the user could opt in and, and uh, give us, give us you know, a one star review. And what we saw well, was a pretty dramatic increase in the number of both like reviews and you know, especially um, positive reviews. But you know, like that's pretty common that probably a lot of you do similar things. So the most, what I wanted to talk to you about was one thing that we did that was pretty cool and that helped us, you know, really helped us uh, act, take action on the, on the reviews. And that was plug the, the, the after reviews into Slack. Because I mean, you get one star, one star reviews, uh, but they're in the app store and like you might not look at them, like you might not feel you know, anything about them. You don't want to even look at them because they, you know, they mean something bad. But like if you have them on Slack, like we did, like we are looking at them every day. And you know, if we get one star reviews, like it's there and we don't want to see them. So like we do, we go and, and fix them. So that was, that was pretty, pretty important for us. Uh, it's, it seems like a small thing, but really like getting the feedback in your face, like really helps, uh, uh, yeah, getting, getting a fix. And yeah, one more thing that, that we do in terms of feedback, this is kind of internal, but like we, we travel a lot because the company wants people that travel and we, we like to travel, that's why we work there. And since we're remote, remote we, we, can work, we can travel and work and, and we do it. Um, so, so when we travel, we try to go to cities that the app has or maybe we don't try, but since we're traveling, like we might go to some cities that the app has and we actually do a lot of, a lot of testing on, on the cities that we have and we it's it's really cool because we find like two two like two main issues. The first the first one is like we find a lot of issues that people like won't report, like small annoyances that no one else would report to us because they're very small. And so we find those. We take the time to test and we, we fix the things that you know like no one else would report. But also we find new opportunities for, for the app. Like for example, last year we were in uh, I think it was in New York and we couldn't find our hotel and we didn't have uh, we didn't have three G or anything four G because we tried to well we use the app like someone like a user would like a user would. So we didn't have we didn't have internet on, on our phones. So we couldn't find a hotel and we were like it would be really cool if we could just be in you know, the address of being like the hotel into the map and have it always there. So we just, we implemented that a few months ago and it was, it's great. Like now people use it all the time and that was something that we wouldn't have found otherwise. So, so yeah, pretty cool. So now you've collected all this feedback, internal and external from like the team and users. And now you have to, you have to iterate on it, right? You have to uh, implement fixes and improve the, the app. So one of the things that I think is really useful is to ship early and ship often. Like sometimes, you know, you wanna you wanna have it just perfect. You wanna have the you know the the, the feature with all like the, all the components, the perfect animations. Like everything is great, but uh, you won't learn as much of, about the feature uh, as you will when you when you ship. When you ship, like users will tell you, you'll find crashes. Like you make it a lot better. So so you need to ship. For example, we, we have this, this feature that we wanted to ship last year. It's already in the app. It's called Phrasebox, and it allows you to just basically play, play phrases uh, on the app, like com very common phrases, and it allows you to communicate with locals. Like, you, you know, if you go to a restaurant, like, you can play the phrase to order something, and you can learn, learn it yourself and, and say it, but it allows you to communicate. And we wanted to ship this for the Olympics, for the Olympics in Rio de Janeiro, so people that was going there uh, and they, you know, if they didn't speak Portuguese, they could, uh, you know, talk to, talk to the locals. But the problem is that when we came up with a feature, uh, you know, the, the Olympics were, uh, were very close and we wouldn't make it to, to, you know, with the design, we wouldn't make it for the Olympics. So we decided to, to cut the scope and, like, uh, make something very simple, like, like this, you can see. It's as very standard, like the, the original design had a lot of, a lot of animations, um, but we decided to just cut the scope, make something simple, and, and ship it. And then months later, when we uh, had the time, we really went back and added a, a better, you know, a better uh, navigation. It's flatter. We added these like playback screen that allows you to read the 
the, uh, the actual phrases being played, the logic deposit, all these things that we couldn't add at the beginning. So, so yeah, and, and we made it for to, to the Olympics, so that was, that was great. Also, when you're, when you're in, the, you know, in the rush to create things, you always tend to think, as the developers or designers, as the creators of the product, we tell to keep thinking about what's next, the next features, how I'm, I'm going to make this app better, what's cool about this new thing. And we also, we are just like that. But uh, one of the things that we realized that we were doing wrong is, is to not put enough attention to stability. And stability is key. Um, we were trying to just put all the, all the work on creating new features instead of like, trying to make the app as, as stable as possible. And in the end, like, there were, we reached a point where like, uh, the, um, the app had a lot of like, bugs in the, in, right in the, in the home screen. So we realized that first, you need to put a lot of attention to make the app be stable uh, before you start working on new features. And second, you need to, um, if you need to balance the work, it's better to put the work on the main screens of the app because some of it, like we, we were, I remember we spent like two weeks trying to fix a bug that was in a really remote uh, part of the app and just a few percentage of people, uh, of the users that we were, that were using the app uh, were getting there. But then if you put all that work into the home screen and uh, all the initial uh, uh, parts of the app, that's, those are screens that everybody that uses the app uh, uses every day. So uh, you need to put all the focus in there instead of like all the corners of the app where, where the users rarely, rarely get into. Um, and then the UI. Uh, you probably have had this discussion between designers and developers where the designer wants to do a lot of like uh, crazy animations or like you know, interactions uh, and the developers are like, there's no way we can do that on time. And you need to find a balance between what is actually shippable on time, what is actually worth it. And again, we realized that because we wanted to do a lot of animations and a lot of like custom stuff, uh, if we could use that time to make the initial experience of the app great, people will feel like the whole app is great, even though the end, like the other extreme of the app, doesn't have so many animation or is not that custom or is is not as good as the initial part. So if you need to balance that workload, it is better to put it on the, on the most important screens of the app, the initial experience, because that sets the, the expectations for, for the users. Oops. There we go. So yeah, uh, a little recap. We talked about framing. We talked about um, how important it is to understand the, the problem that you're trying to solve and how we can now let, how the users should lead the business and not the other way around. So when you're executing that, you want to maximize feedback and minimize interruptions. You want to maximize feedback by creating steps where, where it can get, be given. You have to minimize blockers and interruptions. So even if you're not remote, like you don't need to, you need to, to um, you don't need to depend on another person to, to hand you the, the work before you can get started. So yeah, so those two are really important. Yep. We're also talking about the importance of listening to your users. Uh, they know better than you probably how they use the product. So even if you think you, you're right, you should listen to them as much as possible. Uh, build as many communication channels as you can so you, you, the experience is as, as transparent as possible. Um, Ask them, and if you do, ask them in the right context. And uh, use, the, uh, use your app. If you're building an app for, that you cannot use because you're doing it for something that you're used to do, uh, get as close as possible to the actual users and get to understand how, how to use the app, what they do. And uh, yeah, app reviews, of course, are important. So uh, spend time uh, looking at them and have them as present as possible because that Push, that puts the, the pressure on you uh, in order to fix things and to improve the app. Yeah, and once you have all, all the feedback, like you said, you need to iterate on it, like so ship early, ship often, uh, prioritize stability over features so users don't hate you, and you know, balance the UI workloads so that 
you don't you you don't spend all these cycles uh, building UI that won't that is not necessary, but also you have to appreciate it because uh, users will appreciate it. And actually, it's one of the things uh, we get five like more I think more more five stars for. Like yeah, it's 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 something that people really like. That's it. That's all, all we got. Uh, if you have any questions, just. Thank you. I don't know if anyone has any question. We've been pretty fast. There's a lot of things. So. Cool. Right. Well, well thank th you. Thank you very much.